And the Lord said, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house might be filled. The call is for real ministry. So to my fellow ministers, People dying out on the streets, killing each other senselessly. Prisons are filled with family. So many babies, so little food to eat. Another mother grieves today. Cause a baby boy, he was killed by a gangster's strength. Calling all preachers, teachers, and real ministers. Where you at? The hungry, the empty. Tell them to come in Hit the highways and hedges to Let's Talk About It, What Are You Doing? I'm your host, Apostle Dr. Lois Sullivan Gibson. Our topic today is excessive force. Let's take a look at their mission statement. I want to talk about service employing a customer service approach, recognizing that our customers are the community. 
other personnel within the department and other city employees. Partnership, utilizing a strong police community partnership for problem solving. Integrity, applying moral, ethical, and professional standards. But is this what is really going on here? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to do what you've called me to do. Let this word of truth encourage and give people the information that they've lacked on this very matter. So Lord, as the viewers wind up seeing this video, we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I'm going to just record on you, okay. and uh, this is on you right now. <clears throat> and, um, I'm going to ask the questions, and I'll edit out what I need to. Okay, um, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to do what you've called me to do. Let this word of truth encourage and give people the information that they've lacked on this very matter. So Lord, as the viewers wind up seeing this video, we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to tell the viewers your name, and I want you to share who your brother was as a brother to you, and then I want you to tell your experience when you got the call and how it has impacted the family even now. My name is Tashina Duran. Um, Cole Stump is my baby brother. He is the baby, you know, like we have a baby sister, but he's my mom's only son, so wow. he's, he's the baby. Um, he is a cowboy. You know, he's lived the cowboy life. He's wild. He loved women. <laughs> you know, like, it's... He was, like, he's always made everything out of a joke. Like, even, like, if we were sitting there sad, like, we call them trauma jokes. Because mm. <laughs> it's like, either we're going to cry or you're going to laugh about it, you mm. know? And we get tired of crying sometimes. Um... I'm I'm the oldest sister, so I'm I'm the one who's always on everyone. You know, I'm like about getting their life, you know, not even their life together, just being being I guess like a better person, a better person to the family. You know, just being there and like I guess being the older sister, I was more disapproving of a lot of the stuff that if he wasn't my brother, I probably wouldn't have been. Like, with anyone else, I'm probably like, oh, you know, like, whatever. Not Maybe not whatever, but, like, not as hard on them. Um, I, no one in my family even got a call from the police department or the coroner or anything. Um, I found out from my brother's youngest son's mom. My brother has five kids. He has three boys and two girls, and they're all staggered, gr boy, girl, boy, girl. Um, the age group? What's the age group? Kaysen is, just turned 13. Tyan is 10. Colt is six. Aslan is four, and baby Cole just turned one. Wow. So, um, it's been real hard on my nephew. Um, my nephew lost his mom three years ago on April 7th, that'll be three years ago, and then, you know, he's only 13 and he lost his dad. Wow. <clears throat> but that one night we went up to the rims and, you know, we were just sitting there because we were wondering if they still had the teepees up there and he wanted to go look up there and, you know, go take a rock up there for his dad where they were doing the rocks. And after we left, we went and got gas and there was a homeless person sitting there and he's like, Auntie, do you have any money? No. And I'm like, yeah, you know, here, give him this. And he was like, you know what we should do, Auntie? And I was like, what? He's like, that's what we should do, is we should help the homeless in my dad for, you know, honor my dad. Amen. And that's Amen. why I was like, oh, I was like, my baby, I love your heart. You know, like, you're, like, that's good, you know. And I guess, like, it's been really hard, like, it's been really hard. Um, okay, so... Um, my brother knew he was going to die. 
I had talked to my brother a month before this, and he knew that he was going to get shot and killed by Billings police officers. Why? He he kind of elaborated, but not too much. I mean, like I I, I kind of I know the reason, but I guess I'm just not ready to say. Okay, that's that's fine. That's like, fine. Just because, but like he he knew the like trying to get questions. It's really it's. At times, it's almost caused a rift between my family because we're we're sad, but there's also a lot of anger. Of course. And so, you know, like, we can't lash out at these people, you know, like, they're, they're just not giving answers. So, you know, we kind of lash out at each other at times, and it makes it hard because how do you deal with this? Mm -hmm. Um... I I guess like after like knowing knowing that what my brother told me I knew there was so, like I guess I knew there was something wrong like if he knew that he was gonna get shot and so I started asking questions you know and it just didn't it the versions just didn't make sense of what they were telling me you know it kept slowly changing first like the first interview that St John did there was no gun mentioned at all. Then the second interview, he mentions, oh, and there was a gun found on scene at the very end of it. And then next, it was, that was their main focus. Oh, he had a gun on him. He pulled a gun. But it didn't make sense with their stories because he said that, you know, they had him on the ground with his arms pinned under him. Yeah. <clears throat> My brother is 5'9", you know, 5'10". He's not... He's not very big built. He, you know, is like 150, 140 pounds. And these officers were over six foot, over 200 pounds. A few of them. How I don't understand how they were, how they didn't have the de-escalation techniques to not kill him. They they executed my brother. He was shot directly in the left temple. He was shot. Three or four times in the head. Wow. He was shot seven plus times in the body. Um, we didn't get to, like, because in our, like, in our culture, you know, like, we'll go there and we'll dress them and all that. They wouldn't let us dress him. We had to have a closed casket because my brother didn't have a face. Wow. Like we we went up and like went and viewed him, you know, just like me and my my sister, my mom, my brother. Like we we went up and like we viewed him and we and decided as a family that we were gonna have a closed casket because we didn't want his kids seeing him like that. That's understandable. And my I know my brother, you know, he we all do bad things in life, but he wasn't a bad person at all. These, these cops are scary. They are, they use intimidation tactics, they use stalking tactics. They, they really try to make people feel like they're crazy. Like it's, I don't know how else to describe it, but, but that, have you ever looked up gang stalking? Mm -mm. Tell me about that. <clears throat> gang stalking is when a group of people stalk a person but it's never just one person doing it so you can't ever just point the finger at one person okay it's a group of people who like I guess like stalk these people to intimidate them you know like and it does really make you feel crazy because like when then when you're like well them because you can't ever name a specific person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but as I said like you know I called the cops on the cops knowing it was the cops and the only thing they were worried about was where I was and what I was driving. Wow. They weren't worried about the car that, one of the cars matched to the plates, but another car, the plates didn't match because we took down plate numbers and they weren't, they weren't worried about that at all. All they wanted to know was where we were and what I was driving. And I was like, why is that relevant? You know, I was like, well, I was like, can I just come down to the station and file a report? 
And they're like, oh, no, no, an officer will contact you. Wow. I was like, well, I would rather prefer to go down to the station. Absolutely. And they were just like against it. And then when, like, then this officer calls me back and it was just, uh, it, like, I guess it's nothing concrete, but it was just a feeling I had. I felt that it wasn't like sincere, that it wasn't, you know, like they, and then I went and got the instant report mm -hmm. so I could have proof of it. And they only marked down one of the cars I gave them. They didn't mark down both cars I called in. So the car that was real, they didn't put down, they put down a fake one. Yep. Wow. Okay. But uh, so I was like, I've, I've learned from the beginning of this, take notes of everything, write everything down. When you communicate with them, communicate with them through emails because they'll tell you one thing and then... That's smart. <laughs> the paper trail, absolutely. Yeah, and it's like, I guess just... Growing up how I did, like, you know, like, you never, I guess, never wanting a paper trail. I've never wanted a paper trail so hard, much in my life of where I've been, who I've been in contact with, because I'm, I'm I guess I'm not scared. I'm scared of the situation and the reality of it, but I'm not scared, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Like, reality is very frightening. Yeah. And I... I just don't understand how people are so ugly. Like it... I don't know. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What are you looking to really happen from the loss of your brother? What type of changes are you looking for? Something positive. There was enough ugly in my brother's death that there, there doesn't need to be any more ugliness added to it. It was ugly enough. So, I guess, like, try using it to go in a more positive direction of, I guess, like, you know, like, I know all officers are, are bad, aren't are bad, but there are some, you know, like, in, like, like, they say to us, you know, you fit the description. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, let me ask you this. Who, the five children, who are taking care of the children, the family, or? Mm -hmm. Um, each of them have different moms. Okay. So, my oldest nephew, he lives with his his grandpa, his mom's dad, mm -hmm. with his younger brother. Um, he comes to the house, you know. Uh, who's next? Tyan. Tyan lives with her mom, and she lives in Polson. Um, Colt lives with his mom. They, like all their moms, they all live with their moms. Their moms take care of them, but they do come around. You know, they bring them around. They talk and they're you know cordial and hang out before the kids and all that. So that's good. So another question would be: Are is the entire family getting therapy? Why not? Because this is something you guys need to get it's, therapy. Um, well, I guess like my my oldest niece just started. Mm-hmm. But we we never dealt with this before, you know, we didn't know where to turn, like, there was no help anywhere. There was no one to reach out to for help. So that's kind of how I, this, the Warrior Women for Justice started, because I started reaching out to these families, because I felt alone. Mm -hmm. You know, like, we, like, even though we were there as a family, it was a lot of alone feeling just because everyone deals with their grief in their own way and I figured if I was feeling alone these families probably felt alone mm -hmm. and I reached out mainly because I, I needed the support but it turned around that we could support each other you know we all have bad days we all have days where we want to quit and we'll sit there and we'll vent and you know, be mad about it for a minute, and then we're all like, okay, let's do this, you know, because we're stronger together. And so my question is, even with the support group, are you all individually seeking mental health support? Because you really need to address this anger and pain and depression and sense of loss, bereavement. No, I don't think... I think my niece may be the only one who is. Okay, so if I send you information 
would you? I would. I, I. I can't. I can't say that I would go or do it, but I would look it over and consider it. <laughs> that's good. That I can do that. I can send. Because one thing about me, I'm a deep diver, and I look. And I know there are free uh, bereavement groups, individual. Um, it's part of your mental health status. Yeah, so order and we, you, but we live on a reservation too, and it's just harder to, it's harder to kind of access that kind of care. Why is that? Because we, we live thirty minutes from the nearest town, and it's just the poverty of just oh, just poverty overall. You know, getting to these appointments or even just getting them scheduled is hard because. Most of the time we have to go, like, if it's something that needs to be paid for, we have to go through IHS and they have to approve it and you have to get referred out and it's a process already by then. Jesus. So you're saying on, you're, you're on the reservation. Mm -hmm. And which reservation is this one? In Rocky Boy. Okay. And the, and the native tribe name is? Um, Chippewa Creek. Okay. See, this is all, all education for me. I have no clue. This, this is what I'm loving this too. We um we live about 30, 30 miles from the Canadian border. Wow, you're way up there. Yeah. <laughs> we are the smallest reservation in Montana. So on the reservation, there is no mental health component. They, they do have mental health doctors, but. I think there's such a stigma against it that a lot of people don't go to it or use it or uh, it's just, it's harder than it should be to access it. So why don't you be the trailblazer to find out about that? That was, they, honestly that was never even a thought that I had considered as part of this, I guess. Well, I but, want you to be wet. Well, <laughs> but it was like... <laughs> It, I guess, like, you know, that it was that I wanted, I wanted to change things so no one else loses their brother. Mm -hmm. Change begins with you. Because if you're not healthy enough to continue this journey to be the voice because of the depression, the anger, um, bad days where you can't even get out because you're not addressing you. You have to stay healthy because you're going to be the voice for your entire family. And it's a big, big system. Back to being the big system, and, and you're gonna lead by example. I guess, but like even be like, I, I don't know what I expected. Like I, I guess I always thought something good would come from it, but I never like even th just sitting here with you. Like, mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for, you know, people just listening. And that, like, the list people listening does help. You know, it's people realizing. I guess like why this is so wrong, why we're angry, you know, why we're hurt. And like Lita had said, like the victim shaming is so horrible when people are saying, oh, well, they deserve to die. No one deserves to die by another's hand. Exactly. And when Lita told me that terminology, that's the first time I ever heard of it, you know, coming from New York, we don't hear things like that. But that, I had asked her to explain that to me too, and I was like, what? I was confused hearing it, you know, and, um... But we're supposed to be able to have that faith in our police officers that they're doing absolutely. the correct thing. We should be able to, we should be able to trust that's what the situation was, but it seems time and time again it's proved not to be. But, you know, even from, like, anywhere else the inquest is a fact-finding hearing. Mm -hmm. Here it's to find the officers justified or not. It's a lot of well if this, it, this could have happened or if this would have happened you know it's not the straight facts it's how they want to sway it to sound it's like editing their story yep they they call the the county attorney is the one who does the coroner's inquest he you know basically he's the one who decides whether they're going to be charged or not they decide which witnesses are called, they decide which questions are asked, like the family gets no input. During the inquest they said we can write down a list of things that they may ask wow. the witness. There's no victim's family advocate, there's like a liaison to like help us navigate this and 
with as many police involved shootings as we have in buildings, you would think that that kind of thing would be in place. Like, it's obviously a more common occurrence than not. Which is sad, because these are people who are supposed to protect us. Like, if something bad were to happen, I would probably try to call anyone else but the cops first. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 it's very mind-blowing here, the things that I've been learning since I've been here and since I started my show. Um, what I love about this whole process, too, is this show is about giving the underserved a voice to be heard. Because, first of all, your brother was a human being. Yeah, he he was loved. Mm -hmm. He is loved. Mm -hmm. You know, like, even even if he's not here, we still love him. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was telling people, like, because people are like, well, they went so far as saying, like, you doing this isn't going to bring him back. Who said, who said? Just people talking, you know, people who don't think I'm doing this for the right reason or who don't like the don't like the attention or don't want to be asked questions. Oh, okay. I was trying to figure out where was this confusion yeah. coming from. And but it's like, because he's my baby brother, because I loved him. Exactly. You have every right to be the voice of your brother, especially and when he didn't die a natural death. Yeah, his life was taken from him horribly. Like, why... Why was he shot in the left temple? Like, that's execution style. Even in the military, you're taught never to shoot in the head. You're taught to shoot center mass, the largest part of the body. Mm -hmm. Why are they shooting them in the head? Billings is the only large city in Montana without a policy requiring an outside agency to lead investigation into fatal officer-involved shootings. It is evident that Billings Police Department, out of the 119 law enforcement agencies within the state of Montana, is operating in what I call a privileged mentality, aka untouchable mindset. Why wouldn't you want to keep the people and the community at peace and operating on one accord with you? Since we are a state of Christians, 65% are Christians. So why do we have this mentality? I want to thank you for joining us and let's talk about it. What are you doing? And I want to invite you back for part two, where we continue with a sister sharing the pain and loss of a brother, her baby brother, and how the death of one impacts many in the community, no matter what your color is, no matter what your gender is, excessive force is not acceptable. And let the healing begin. Up in a club, out in the streets, you'll find a captive who needs set free. There is a child strung out on drugs, never experienced real love. Our Christian children are confused, cause we let them take Jesus Christ and prayer out of school. Calling all prayer warriors and intercessors, where you at? quickly die and tell me who are you reaching when was the last time you got out in your kicks and walked around and ministered in the bricks or talked to a girl the fellas labeled a trick or